Okay, we're ready. G'day everyone. Uh, so last time I spoke about cattle production, today I'm going to speak about uh, sheep production in Australia. <laughs> oh, it's bugged it up. It's it. Okay, there we go. Uh, how do we do uh, next? Oh, you just down arrow? Okay, make it smaller then. There you go. Okay. There you go. So a bit about the industry. Um, so we're the second largest producer in the world after China. Uh, in 2017, live export of 2 million uh, sheep to major markets such as Kuwait, Qatar and Turkey. Uh, in 2016, 56% uh, uh, of Australian land production was exported to major markets such as the US, China and the UAE. Um, our major breeds are the Merino. The Merino is like the primary uh, wool sheep. Um, we also have Pole Dorset and Suffolk, uh, which are meat sheep. Then we have the Border Leicester, which is a uh, dual purpose, and Dorpa and Damaras, which are clean skins. So this is on my place, uh, we've, we've got Dorpers, and uh, this is one of our Border Collies. We have, uh, we have eight dogs, we have four Border Collies and four Marama sheep dogs, which I'll explain about soon. Now, Matt, um, the, ones, the sheep that go to the United States, is that live or not? I think that's uh, just me. Yeah, okay, so I don't think process. That's, yeah, process, right. yeah. Um, so here we've got uh, Australia, and uh, as you can see, Queensland, which had the biggest uh, Maybe cattle. Maybe point that out to us. Your pointer. Queensland, yeah, sorry, QLD up here. This is where I'm from. Um, so it had the largest population of uh, cattle. But uh, as you can see here, along with the NT, it's pretty uh, small in sheep numbers. And that's mainly just to do with uh, the climate. And uh, it's, it's, it's a bit hot up here. And, and also um, the availability of feed. So down here's, so Brisbane's over here, if you've heard of Brisbane. And uh, I live in land a bit, about three hours from Brisbane, um, on a farm uh, just above the, above the border here of New South Wales, which has the most sheep. So this is my place. Um, it's called Artunga. Uh, so it's located in Amanamar, Queensland, Australia. Um, it was previously a dorper stud for about 10 years, and it was about 7,000 acres. Um, it's, it was, from then on it was subdivided and now it's commercially run by my family uh, for sheep production and cropping. Um, so these photos on the left here, we have a farming association prior to us owning the, the property. Um, they basically ran these uh, land finishing workshops which were educating farmers on how to achieve the best prices for their lambs. So as you can see, that's our wool shed up the top. It's a, it's a fine piece of infrastructure, probably one of the best pieces of infrastructure on our place. Um, and then we have below there all these undercover yards, um, and, and that's a, one of the races there. Um, just because it gets so hot, we, it's, it's beneficial to have everything undercover. Um, so I talk about the Dorper breed. Um, I'll try and get his head in there. Um, so the Dorper is a South African uh, meat breed developed in the 1930s from crossing the Dorset Horn and the Black-Headed Persian. Um, it's the second largest breed in South Africa and since the introduction to uh, in 1996, numbers have grown to an estimated 2 million in Australia. So they're relatively uh, a small industry as there's about 70 million head of sheep in Australia. Um, so as you can see on the left here, we have a Dorper ram. Um, they have a black face. If they're known as a dorper, they have a black face. And then we have below there, there's a, a fine looking ewe and a couple lambs, uh, which are known as white dorpers, and they have a white face. So advantages of the dorper, um, they produce a superior carcass and excellent meat quality under vast range of conditions. Uh, they've got a reputation, uh, reputation for rapid weight gain and good fat distribution. Uh, they're non-selective grazers and have excellent uh, feed conversion. They're, one of the main things about Dorpers is they have, uh, it's, it's, they're low maintenance sheep because they have this shedding ability, um, which reduces the need for shearing, mulesing, uh, crutching or tail docking. So basically a Dorper will have uh, a combination of wool and hair and they can shed 
basically uh, shed any extra hair or wool. Um, they're highly fertile and very maternal ewes, which produce fast growing vigorous lambs. And they have a thick skin and natural pigmentation, which helps protect from skin cancers that are seen in many other breeds. Um, so here's on my place again. Uh, Reproduction on good management and uh, forest conditions, Dorper ewes will land three times every two years, and uh, they generally have about 2.25 lambs on an annual basis. Um, the gestation period is around 147 days, and uh, lambing intervals around six to eight months. So on our farm, we uh, we join our rams uh, the whole year round, so we're lambing all year round. Um, basically, we do this because it's it's low maintenance. Um, it's lower maintenance in a way that we don't have to pull rams out. We don't have to move rams around. Um, however, we do have to frequently um, do lamb marking because we're lambing all year. Uh, we run rams at three percent. You could probably get away with two percent. Um, some people do four percent, but we find three percent is uh, ideal really depends on the size of your paddocks and uh, your flock numbers just to make sure that the rams are getting around to, uh, to all the ewes. Uh, a bit about the health management. So on the right here, here's a bit of a small pen at, uh, at home full of lambs. And uh, basically we bring them in. We, tr we try and do it when we're drenching so that we can do it all at the same time. Um, so we'll get all the mobs in, uh, we'll draft out all the lambs into, uh, all these unmarked lambs into smaller pens and uh, it's, it's a two or three man kind of operation where uh, basically someone can be picking the lambs up by hand, putting them in this cradle, uh, which you can see below there, um, and then someone is ear tagging, uh, we do tail docking and castration with rings and uh, we give them a six in one vaccination and an oral drench. So about the, uh, the oral drench, it's a multi-combination uh, for broad spectrum worm control around four times a year, depending on uh, paddock rotation and rainfall. Um, so basically, it's around four times a year, but it can vary depending uh, on the rainfall. Um, I mean, after rainfall, especially if it's come out of a dry season, uh, you'll find that uh, you'll find uh, the sheep will be grazing closer to the ground, which means there'll be more worms um, uh, after rainfall. Especially, they'll be laying eggs. So, uh, if we do get a high rainfall after a dry season, it's generally pretty uh, important to uh, to drench. So, about the six-in-one vaccination, uh, we give this annually, and. Uh, the brand is Glanvac 6 and it has a protection against cheesy gland which is a bacterial disease and uh, the five main clostridial diseases which include black disease, black leg, malignant oedema, um, pulpy kidney and tetanus. Um, so a bit about the weaning. Weaning occurs around two months of age but it really uh, depends on the availability of feed. Um, and also on our farm we do shear, our, we're shearing at the moment, uh, we do shear our sheep and this is mainly to do with uh, tidying up uh, what, what the fleece on the back of there because uh, for dorpers, for our dorpers especially, um, some, some have more wool than others, some have more hair than others, um, basically after <laughs> rainfall if you do have a fair bit of wool on the back there, you can get fly strike, um, and that's when flies basically uh, hatch uh, inside a damp piece of wool, and then they, the maggots can eat into the sheep, which can cause a major issue. So do you sell that fleece? Uh, no. So no, we, we, we sell our fleece, but you're not going to make much money. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so feeding, uh, here's our place again. This is where we have our weaners. So we've got about four feeders here. Um, for our, This is just after a fair bit of rain. Uh, it's greened up a fair bit, which is good. Um, so basically we have a native blue cooch uh, grass, a kangaroo grass, and we have clovers and ryegrass. 
Uh, we plant crops including oats, which is our primary one. Uh, we'll finish most of our lands on oats. Uh, we have millets and we also grow lucerne on irrigation uh, for hay fodder reserve. Um, in these feeders we generally put grain and uh, finishing uh, land finisher pellets. So the grain uh, can include barley, corn, cotton seed. Uh, we can add sodium bicarbonate into that. Uh, concentrated pellets with buffers and uh, also add mineral additives. Um, so the lamb finisher pellets are about 16% protein and they can include uh, corn, barley, lucerne, cotton seed and crushed lupins. We also throw out uh, protein lick blocks uh, which have 7 to 10% urea. So this is quite interesting, it's uh, flock protection in, uh, in Australia because we have all those dangerous animals which makes Americans not want to come there. Um, so on our farm we use alpacas and marama sheep dogs against pests such as foxes, feral pigs and wild dogs. Uh, even the marambas will chase a few birds down which is helpful because crows and hawks can actually kill lambs. Um, we prefer marambas uh, because they're really active. They are they'll patrol a large space of area. Um, they've got good hearing, they're territorial, and we can also have a really good bondage uh, with the sheep. Um, basically, we can have these Marama sheep dogs because we make the fences dog proof, generally. Uh, we have dog shelters in the paddocks, which we have automatic self feeders. We fill up about once a week. And, uh, People also use donkeys, but uh, in the, these photos, uh, so up on the top left there, this is one of our Marama sheepdogs, uh, his name is Snow, and he is a monster. As you can see below there, I had to, we had to relocate him into a different paddock, and uh, that's my fully grown border collie uh, beside him, and as you can tell, it was pretty hard to get him on the back of the truck. Um, but yeah, he's a monster of a dog, I wouldn't pick on him. So, But he is really friendly, we'll go into the paddock to do a bit of sheep work, and he'll come up to us, we'll give him a pat, and he hangs around a bit, and then he'll go off to the sheep again. Uh, on the right there, we've got a few, uh, an alpaca, that I had to somehow come up behind and put in a bit of a chokehold, because he would have spat on me otherwise. Um, and that's about it. Uh, just before I finish, I just want to talk a bit more about the Marama. Um, so this is one of our Marama sheep dogs. Um, she, I was drenching, uh, drenching ewes and I didn't realise that she was coming up the race with the sheep and she managed to get herself a bit trapped. Uh, she didn't mind it though, she was just happy chilling out. And uh, so this photo, Oddball, it's based on Australian film. Um, it's about... Uh, a Marama sheepdog on the right there, his name is Oddball, and he, uh, he was owned by a chicken farmer down in uh, Victoria. And uh, basically there was this colony, there's, a, there's an island called Middle Island just off uh, the bottom of Victoria there. And uh, it has this colony of fairy penguins. And uh, what was happening was these fairy penguins were dwindling in numbers uh, due to foxes. And basically what happens is they trained Oddball to, to bond with the fairy penguins because he went from being a chicken protector to, to protecting uh, fairy penguins. And it became really successful and numbers went from only having a few birds left to up to a couple hundred. Um, it's now a full, it's a full program. They have full time around sheepdogs protecting these fairy penguins. Um, so yeah, I thought that was so pretty interesting. So are you saying that's a movie? Yeah, Why it's not? an Australian film, if it's you want to watch it. It's an Australian film, yeah. wow, that'd be interesting. Yeah, it's good. So questions, yeah, that's it. comments? Are you ready for questions or yeah, comments? Yeah, go for it. Okay. What, could you give a little detail of how the live sheep are shipped out? Because you know, I know we did that for the cattle too, but. Um, it's, a it's a pretty similar <coughs> process. So we, we don't export our sheep. We have about 3,000 head of sheep on our farm. Uh, but we don't export. We have had people come from Malaysia and uh, Vietnam, I'm pretty sure, that were looking into 
getting them uh, flown. Um, oh, okay. But it's probably something down the track that I could look at. But we probably need more more numbers than three thousand to make it viable because uh, there's a lot of costs, there's a lot of protocols involved. Uh, so yeah, it's probably something that I could look at further down the track if I want to take over the farm eventually. But uh, at the mean in the meantime, we. We're making good money just running a commercial farm. And your, all your production goes to? We sell to sale yards, and uh, oh, okay. that's a large reason why we do shear as well. So the buyers, they look more attractive for buyers. Mm -hmm. uh, we also sell straight to abattoirs. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Okay. Yeah, because you know, years ago they would have uh, these big ships take these sheep across and it's quite a journey because I remember one time I the first time I ever heard of this was um, one of the ships had a fire and every all the crew had to abandon ship and the ship was basically burned to smithereens with the sheep in it so it's kind of nice to see that they fly some too yeah but I don't know how, how often that is now with those big ships going over but kind of like the cattle that you talked about before so I'll let you point to people that have questions yeah what all goes into training uh, so basically, about eight weeks old, we'll get a couple pups, and uh, whether we've bred them ourselves or we've uh, bought them, and we put them into a small pen at about eight weeks old, and we have like a few ewes, we'll put a few ewes in there with lambs, and mm -hmm. basically we'll be feeding all the sheep and the pups in a small pen together. Um, what happens is the ewes kind of butt the bloody you know, they butt the dogs around and the dogs kind of, you know, get a bit older and they start fending for themselves and there's just this bond that occurs and uh, basically like a human and a, and a puppy. And uh, what happens is when, when time comes around, we think they're old enough and they've got a strong enough bond with their sheep, we'll let them out into the flock and the, the dogs will go and live with the sheep. Yeah, because like for dogs and every animal, there's a thing called the period of socialization. So like you, you, you can't wait till they're a year old. It's got to be when they're young. So, you yeah. know, they wean about probably, they wean the dogs at eight weeks. And you raise them with the sheep. And so like, you know, they do this in Indiana someplace. I remember I had a Great Pyrenees came from a farm where the parents were working. Because you either have a working dog or you have a pet. You yeah. can't really have both. Because that yeah. dog needs to stay out there 24-7. We, we try and uh, keep a bit of a bondage with our uh, maremmas. Uh, we also, you know, we, we want them to be friendly. Oh, sure. And yeah. friendly with uh, humans as well. Uh, but, yeah, it's... The thing is, at home, uh, you start giving the dogs too much interaction and you start feeding them, uh, you know, by hand and whatever else. They'll try and stick around the house. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to... Have a bond with them so that they're friendly, but also give them space and let them be with the sheep. Yeah. yeah. Socialize with the sheep. Somebody, any other questions, comments? Okay. So that's a couple of breeds of sheep I've never heard of, and I've never heard of that breed of dog either. Is that a combo of some dogs, or is that? Uh, I think it's related to the Great Pyrenees. Yeah, I, I mean, it reminds they, me of a Great Pyrenees. Maybe it's diluted with something. They originate from uh, Italy. And they used okay. to use them for uh, protection against uh, wolves. Yeah, and that sounds like the Great Pyrenees. Yeah. So, yeah. so it doesn't look great. I mean, is it a double dew claw in the back? You know? Uh, not sure. Oh, okay, because the uh, purebred Pyrenees have two dew claws on each inside of each back leg. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, not sure. Okay, let's give Matt a round of applause.